Thank you very much. And um, is it still morning? Good morning. Um, first of all, I'd like to obviously thank the Trust for inviting me to come up to Port Macquarie. And I'd like to say to you that you think that my journey up here started yesterday afternoon when I got on the plane. A nice hour-long flight. But in fact, my journey to come and see you here today started 25 years ago. Right? It's been a very long journey. 25 years ago, I was a tutor and I was teaching the medical students. And I had a particular student who impressed me very much. And I can remember saying to him, Nader, you're going to be a wonderful doctor someday. <laughs> And, as usual, I was right. <laughs> um, Nada rang me and um, invited me to come up and, of course, I couldn't possibly say no. I'm a girl, I, I, I'm a girl who just can't say no, obviously. Um, and I also want... I had the honour of being asked by Associate Professor Prem Rashid to uh, contribute a chapter to his wonderful book on prostate cancer. And my chapter was about sexuality and prostate cancer. And I would like to encourage any of you um, who uh, have had treatment or are being treated for prostate cancer to talk about the sexual aspects with your doctor, uh, with your specialist, your GP, or the urology nurse, because sexuality is a very important part of the treatment of prostate cancer. Now, my... Um, talk today is called Good Loving Great Sex. And um, I want to tell you that I never planned to become a sex therapist. Right? When I was a little girl, I didn't say to mummy, when I grow up, mum, I want to get paid for talking dirty in public. <laughs> right? In fact, when I was a little girl, what I wanted to do was to become a missionary. However, I became a doctor. I went into general practice, and one of the things that I noticed was that nobody ever talked about their sexual problems. So I started asking, and all of a sudden the floodgates opened because everybody wanted to talk to me about their sexual problems. And over time, I gave up general practice and became a sex therapist. So I suppose you could say I've gone from missionary to missionary position. Now, why would a medical doctor be interested in sex and relationships, right? There's a very, very good reason, and that is that sex is good for you. Now, we might say it's good for you because it burns kilojoules. If you have sex once a week, over a year, you will burn 10,000 kilojoules, which is equivalent to 10 Mars bars, right? <laughs> Sex could be good for you because you get release of endorphins, which reduce pain. So if you've got a stick, stiff neck or achy joints or you're feeling uncomfortable, maybe you've got a headache. You used to think that saying, I've got a headache, was an excuse not to have sex. Well, I'm here to tell you that having sex could actually improve your headache. Sorry, girls. <laughs> uh, but in fact, the reason that sex is good for you is because lovemaking is a specialised form of touching, skin-on-skin skin touching. Now, I want to talk to you a bit about the healing power of touch. When I was a, an intern um, at hospital, I was in the neonatal intensive care unit. And that's, of course, where they have these little premature babies in the humidity cribs. Now, this was a long time ago. But we were told expressly, do not touch the babies, they will die, all right? The idea was that they would get some kind of cardiac arrhythmia and they would drop dead. So nobody ever touched the babies. They just stayed like that in the humidity crib, sometimes for weeks and weeks and weeks. Does anybody know what they do with the premies now? It's called kangaroo care. It was invented here in Australia. Now, you can see this little baby's tubed up. It's got a nasogastric tube going in, so it's not even able to feed itself. It doesn't even, it's not even able to suck. It is so premature, such a tiny little thing. But they put it down the front of mum's shirt or dad's shirt 
right, for skin on skin touching and a more stable heart rate, exactly the opposite of what we were told, more regular breathing, longer periods of sleep, more rapid brain, weight gain, more rapid brain development, less crying, more successful breastfeeding and earlier hospital discharge. These babies survive and thrive if you give them skin on skin touching. Now, as human beings, we need touching from the cradle to the grave, right? I want this on my tombstone. <laughs> um, and of course, the element in our society who doesn't receive enough touching is our elderly people, right? Older people tend to be isolated. They tend not to have many opportunities for touch. When I was a, uh, a reporter, one of the things, I've done many different things. I've been very fortunate. I didn't plan my career. I just kept saying yes to things and um, kept on doing them. And I was a medical reporter on Channel 9. And um, we did a story about the importance of touch in the elderly. And I went into St Vincent's geriatric ward and they took photos of me, filmed me rubbing lotion into an old lady's hand brushing her hair, massaging cream into her face, massaging her feet with cream. And it was really interesting because I received so much feedback from that particular story from nursing homes who said, since we saw your story, we have started touching our patients. Right? And they said they behave better, they sleep better, they're calmer, they're happier. Why? because they're getting vitamin T, all right? You're all so careful to get your vitamin B and your C and your D, but what about your daily vitamin T? How much skin on skin touching do you actually get in your daily life? The laying on of their hands is therapeutic, all right? If you have, for example, a massage or if you cuddle your partner, or you're stroking your partner, or your partner stroking you, your pulse and your blood pressure will drop. You'll get secretions of two wonderful hormones, and that's endorphins and oxytocin. Now, endorphins, they're our opium, our heroin, our morphine, right? They make us feel relaxed. They make us feel content. They make us feel very calm. Right? A very pleasant feeling of well-being. Oxytocin is the cuddle chemical. And I'm going to be talking a bit about oxytocin later on. But if you get secretion of endorphins, you get pleasure and contentment, relaxation and well-being, and there's that pain relief. You also get boosting of the immune system. Now, this has been shown scientifically. I'm not making this up. They measured salivary immunoglobulins. Right? This reflects our... Um, our immune system. And <clears throat> I'm a bit croaky, actually. I lost my voice completely last week. My husband was absolutely delighted. Um, <clears throat> so if I'm a bit croaky, uh, excuse me. OK, so the question is, should I be writing you out a script for sex? All right? Make love and call me in the morning if you don't feel better. All right? Well, there are many avenues for touch. It doesn't have to be sex. We have here a grandmother and a granddaughter. I have six grandchildren um, and the, I have a lot of affection with them. There's dancing. Of course, there's massage, right? Um, but don't forget our pets. Our pets are a very, very important source of, um, of comfort and skin-on-skin -skin touching. Now, I just want to warn you that you shouldn't spend too long with your dog, okay? <laughs> And last but not least... <laughs> OK, now this is a picture of my dog, Jack. Does anyone know what sort of dog he is? He's a mini schnauzer, that's right. Now, when I cuddle my dog, my pulse drops and my blood pressure drops and so does his. Actually, having a schnauzer is quite annoying. One of the things you've got to do is you've got to pluck the hair out of their ears. And I got sick of doing this and I went to the vet and I said to the vet, look, I'm sick of plucking the hair out of Jack's ears. Isn't there something else I could do? 
and the vet thought about it for a moment and he said, well, why don't you try some of that Nair hair removal cream? You can get it from the chemist. So I thought, why not? So off I went to the chemist and I said to the gentleman behind the counter, I'd like to purchase some Nair hair removal cream. And he said, well, madam, if you're going to be using it under your arms, don't immediately apply deodorant. You may get irritation. I said, I'm not going to be putting it under my arms. And he said, madam, if you're going to be putting it on your legs, apply a moisturiser afterwards to avoid dryness. I said, I'm not going to be using it on my legs either. I said, as a matter of fact, I'm going to be using it on my schnauzer. <laughs> and he said, in that case, madam, stay off your bike for at least a week. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about my favourite subject, all right, which of course is sex. Okay, a lot of people find sex really disappointing, all right? Fewer than 50% of couples describe any particular sexual interaction as being mutually satisfying. Well, why is that, okay? The first reason is ignorance, all right? Most people know very little about sex and much of what they know is wrong. Now, I tried to bring up my children with a good sex education. And um, I was once challenged, even as my role as sex therapist, sometimes I can get embarrassed. And this is a situation in where I got embarrassed. I've been teaching the medical students about contraception. I was in my study. My briefcase was open on the floor and it was full of condoms. Now, my sons were five and seven. They were dressed up after their bath in their Mr. Men jammies, right? And they came in together quietly. They just drifted in. And the older one, Ross, said, Mummy, what, what's, what are those? And I said, oh, they're condoms. And he said, what are those for? And I thought, well, this is a good opportunity. I tell my patients and, uh, and people that they should seize the opportunity when it comes up. And I said, well, that's something that you put over your penis to protect it and to stop from having babies. And he said, could I have a look? Right? So I said, yes, fine, have a look. So I picked it up, right? And he opened it and he felt it and he smelt it, right? And then he said to me, to my horror, can I try it on? <laughs> Well, the blush spread from my toes all the way through my body. But I thought to myself, look, in 10 years' time, I'm going to be telling this kid to wear a condom. Here I now, and here I am feeling embarrassed. And I said, sure, go ahead. So he pulled down his little Mr. Men jammies and he put his little dick in this condom. And he looked up at me rather pathetically and said, Mummy, it's not a very good fit. <laughs> And I said to him, darling, I was able to go back into doctor mode, darling, as you get bigger, your bones will get bigger, your muscles will get bigger, and your penis will get bigger too. Now, at this point, Stephen, who was five, hadn't said a word, but he nudged his brother and said in a deep, macho voice, hey, Ross, give it to me. It'll probably fit me. <laughs> Now, I bet none of you had a sex education like that. <laughs> All right. If you were lucky, you might have had some sex ed, ed at school. If you were lucky, your parents might have given you the birds and bees talk. But most people are very ignorant about sex. And as a result, they have unrealistic expectations. Now, where do our unrealistic expectations come from? They come from the media. All right. We are absolutely bombarded with media messages about how sex should be. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Differences between men and women, and I'm going to be talking about that as well, and relationship disruption. Now, where did you get your sex education? All right, Was it at home, was it at school, or did you get none? And most people get their sex education from the media. OK. Now, the media presents the fantasy man. All right? This is the fantasy model of sex. He's like James Bond. He's suave, he's sophisticated. Women just take one look at him and their panties fall down, <laughs> all right? He's, an, he's a sex machine, all right? He can do it anywhere, any place, any time. He can do it if he doesn't want to. He can do it if he doesn't like the woman. He can even do it if he doesn't know the woman, all right? And, of course, he has this incredible equipment. <laughs> mm. It's a metre long, it's hard as steel, it goes all night, right? It's amazing, all right. 
and my husband doesn't mind me using this photo of him. <laughs> so that's your fantasy man. Now, we get these ideas from movies, from television, from print media, but especially from pornography. Pornography gives a very unrealistic view of what sex is like. So people are disappointed, all right? Um, the fantasy woman, all right? What is she portrayed as? A sexually insatiable Barbie doll. She's hot, she's horny, she's man-hungry, she's a nymphomaniac with a speech defect, <laughs> right? She can't say no, right? She's sex-starved, she's on the prowl all the time, and she has battery syndrome. That means she's ever ready for sex. <laughs> mm? And then, of course, there's fantasy intercourse, <laughs> all right? Now, this is an Olympic event, all right, with everybody going for gold on all occasions. They're moaning, they're groaning, they're humping, they're pumping, they're panting, they're sweating. They change positions 25 times. This goes on for hours and hours and hours. Actually, it reminds me of a story about a couple who uh, was, it was their, let me see, 40th wedding anniversary. Right, they'd been married for 40 years. And they went to the same restaurant for dinner that they went to on their first date. And um, they're having dinner and he looks across at her and he says to her, darling, do you remember what we did the first time we came to this restaurant? And she giggled and she said, yes, I do. She said, how could I forget? You took me out the back, you pulled down my pants, you pulled up my dress, you put me up against the fence and you made passionate love to me. And he said, would you like to do that again tonight? And he, she said, I'd love to. So out they went, out the back. Her dress is up, her pants are down, his pants are down. And they're going at it hammer and tongs, right? Now the manager has noticed that they have crept outside and he follows them. And he is treated to a display of sexual activity that he has never even imagined in his, in his dreams, right? They're moaning, they're groaning, they're humping, they're pumping, they're panting, they're sweating. They're doing this over and over and over again for about 15 minutes until they fall completely exhausted on the ground by the fence. And the manager goes up to the gentleman who's lying semi-conscious on the floor <laughs> and says, Man, that was incredible. He said, what is your secret? And the old guy looks up and says, last time we did that, the fence wasn't electrified. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so fantasy intercourse, of course, right, leads to orgasm for both, all right? And not only just an orgasm, but a G-spot orgasm, female ejaculation, multiple orgasms over and over and over again all night. But the reality about female orgasm is very different. Only 30% of women can have an orgasm through intercourse alone. Why? Because the penis goes in and out here and the clitoris, which is the seat of female orgasm, is up here. For 70% of women, that's not enough stimulation of the clitoris to bring them to orgasm. Now, 40% of women need some kind of direct clitoral stimulation to reach orgasm. Now, that might be manual stimulation, oral stimulation, it might be vibrator stimulation, it might be frottage. Now, frottage is a nice French word. It is not fromage, which is cheese. <laughs> I don't want any confusion here. But frottage basically means to hump your partner. But frottage sounds so much nicer, don't you think? <laughs> Actually, I had a, a, a bikey come in and see me and I was trying to talk to him. This is, I'm talking here about outer course, all right? Intercourse is when you do this, outer course is everything else. And I was describing outer course to him and I described, described frottage and he said to me, Dr. Rosie, he said, you mean a dry root? <laughs> and I said, Frottage sounds so much nicer. Please. <laughs> right. So, manual stimulation, oral stimulation, vibrator stimulation, frottage. The manual stimulation may be given by the man, but it may need to be given by the woman. And it may be before intercourse, during intercourse, after intercourse, or instead of intercourse. That is the biggest group of women. 
right? If you fall into that group, then you're in the majority group. And finally, 30% of women never or rarely have an orgasm in the presence of a partner. And that's because most of them are waiting to have an orgasm through intercourse, right? And it just isn't going to happen. So, now I'm going to talk to you... <laughs> about a very common problem, all right? And uh, the reason I say it's common is because desire discrepancy, a difference in desires, is not a sexual dysfunction. It is an inevitability in every long-term relationship. Now, in about 75% of my patients, the man wants sex more often than the woman. But in 25% of patients, the woman wants sex more often than the man. Right? You could think if we could just mix them all up and match them up to each other, everybody would be happy. But I think that desire discrepancy would persist. Now, this is the book that I wrote, Good Loving, Great Sex. Great title. Um, and it is about desire discrepancy and it works whether the man has the higher desire or the woman has the higher desire. Now, I wrote this in 1997. All right? This is a long time ago. Right? It is still selling. It's a bestseller. All right? And it just shows you how common this problem is. Now we're going to do a little physiology, all right? We've looked at the below the navel, all right? Now we're going to look at the bit... We're going to sort of shift our gaze up to the brain. Now, this is the limbic system in the brain here, and that's where desire is. And what I want you to imagine, right, is that there is a desire spot on your brain. And on that spot is a dial or a dimmer switch or, or something that you... like a thermostat that you can turn up and you can turn down. Now, things that turn desire up are called desire enhancers. Things that turn desire down are called desire inhibitors. Now, depending on how many enhancers you have in your life and how many inhibitors you have in your life, that will determine your amount of desire. Lots of inhibitors, no desire. Lo few inhibitors and lots of enhancers, lots of desire. So it's quite a simple equation. Now, here are some typical desire inhibitors. Physical, fatigue, ill health medications, particularly medications like antidepressants. Emotional, stress, depression, anxiety, worry, guilt, shame. Relationship, poor communication, resentment, anger, conflict, unresolved hurt, lack of trust, disrespect, infidelity. And finally, sexual inhibitors, dissatisfaction, no longer being attracted to your partner, boredom, painful sex, a history of sexual abuse or assault. So those are all things that will turn down the desire dial. Now, what about enhancers? Well, there are some enhancers that men and women have in common. So obviously, being well-rested, having good health, being emotionally stable, having a good relationship and satisfying sex, they're all enhancers. And they're common to both genders. But there are some specific enhancers that are typically preferred by men and some that are typically preferred by women. So let's have a look at women's enhancers. Okay, communication, intimacy. I say intimacy is in to me see. Right? Letting the other person see who you are behind the mask that you wear out there in everyday life. Right? Really getting to know the other person. Words of love and affirmation. Romantic gestures, affection, non-demand affection. What does that mean? Guys, that means affection without the groping. Um, quality time with partner, low level of conflict. Now, one of the things that you will all know is that these female enhancers are present in abundance when you are courting. So guess when sex drive, female sex drive is at its highest? In the early phase of the relationship. So this is called the limerence phase. It lasts 6, 12, 18 months, and it's a wonderful romantic phase. You can't keep your hands off each other. You want to be together all the time. You talk on the phone for hours. You don't sleep as much. You don't eat as much, all right? His breath smells good in the morning and all his jokes are funny, all right? <laughs> but it's a very artificial time. It's a trick that Mother Nature plays on us to get us together and copulate, all right? But these enhancers are present in abundance, but they tend to disappear in time. Right? We get used to being together. We move from the infatuation to the attachment phase and these things tend to disappear and along with it, female sex drive also declines. Now, as the relationship matures, domestic support becomes a very important desire enhancer for women. 
It has been proven scientifically through studies that men who help with the housework get more sex. Right? Now, men often ask me, are there any power-operated devices I can use to turn my woman on? And I say, absolutely. The iron, the vacuum cleaner and the washing machine. <laughs> Works every time. OK. So, there is no doubt that men and women are different. <laughs> OK. So, what are male enhancers, right? Male enhancers... Right? Anything visual, it's said that men fall in love with their eyes and women fall in love with their ears. Men are very visually stimulatable. Men like pornography. They really like it. They, some women like pornography too, but far more men like pornography. Nudity, lingerie, anything that says sexual, av sexual availability. So a backless, topless, frontless, bottomless outfit, <laughs> all right, works really well, all right. A sexy pose that says, come here and do it to me, all right? That is an enhancer. A responsive partner, varied lovemaking, novelty, spontaneity, erotic pornography. People ask me, what's the difference between erotica and pornography? Now, it's a personal decision, and it will be different for every single one of you. Because erotica is what turns you on, and pornography is what offends you, right? Unfortunately, what is erotic for men is often pornographic for their wives, right? And offensive. Now, before I move on, for the gentlemen in the audience, I want to ask you a question. I just want to check your eyesight. What colour was the car in the previous slide? <laughs> Anybody know? Who said what car? <laughs> OK. I once had a guy who could tell me not only the colour, but the make, the model and the year, and I sent him for therapy. <laughs> OK. Now, what's the problem, all right? Men and women have different enhancers. So John comes to see me, all right, and he says, listen, he's about 45, he says, listen, Dr Rosie, he said, Mary, my wife, has gone off sex and I've tried everything I can possibly think of to turn her on, all right? But what did he do, all right? He gave her a pair of glow-in-the-dark crutchless <laughs> panties. Is that a male enhancer or a female enhancer? <laughs> right? And I said, well, John, what else have you tried? And he said, I got her a porno video. <laughs> and I said, what else? And he said, oh, I got her this sex toy. You know, it rotates, it vibrates, it pulsates. The only thing it doesn't do is light your cigarette after sex. He said, it's absolutely fantastic. And I said, John, what effect did these things have? And he said, really turned me on. <laughs> right? But of course, these are male enhancers. When man, a man wants to turn a woman on, he buys a lingerie. All right? That turns him on. And I said to him, John, you would be far better off organising a romantic dinner for two giving her breakfast in bed, making her the odd cup of tea or coffee, holding hands with her, having quality time with her, conversation, affection. And I said to him, John, if you really want to turn Mary on, get into rubber. Rubber gloves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he needed to give Mary her enhancers, not his enhancers. OK, so a simple message. Don't try and make your partner want sex. Make your partner want you. OK, so how to impress a woman? Well, it's easy. Wine her, dine her, call her, hug her, hold her, surprise her, compliment her, smile at her, laugh with her, cry with her, cuddle her, shop with her, give her jewellery, buy her flowers, hold her hand, write her poetry and love letters, and finally go to the ends of the earth and back for her. OK, that's how to impress a woman. <laughs> now, how do you impress a man? Okay. Um, this is the book that some lucky, some lucky uh, person in the audience, persons in the audience are going to get. This is Where Did My Libido Go? This is for women with low desire. And um, I wrote this, uh, I can't remember when I wrote it, a couple of years ago. Um, but it's, it's, it's very helpful, 
all right, because women are readers, all right, they like to read books. I mean, if you give a man a book, he's, he's less likely to read it. Um, but this um, not only talks about problems with desire, but problems with arousal as well. So, the important message for today, all right, is not about what happens in the bedroom, but really what happens outside the bedroom, because that sets the scene. Sex begins outside the bedroom. And women need what I call 23 and a half hour foreplay <laughs> to be interested in sex. And that means that everything that happens in a woman's day affects her capacity for desire and arousal. So a guy can have a really crappy day, all right? He can be sick with the flu, he can have an argument with his boss, he can have a flat tire on the way home, right? But he still wants sex at night. <laughs> Right? Now, with a woman, you have a few little tiffy words with her in the morning and there's no way <laughs> that she's going to have sex with you at night. No way. You can forget it. Okay. No deal. <laughs> okay. So, what do you do for 23 and a half hour foreplay? Well, I like to talk to my patients. I say, talk about the love bank. I say, you've got to be an investor in your love bank. Right? You want to build goodwill in the relationship. And you want to make sure that you're not a bank robber. Right? Because if you're a bank robber, you steal from your love bank. All right? And those things that steal from the love bank are conflict and criticism and contempt. Right? All those kinds of things that we talked about as desire inhibitors. They are what bank robbers do. But I'm going to talk to you about how to love your partner more effectively. And this is something that I learnt in my marriage and it's really made a big difference to my understanding of myself and my husband. So investors are givers, all right? Now, early in the relationship, you're both investing, you know, during that limerence phase, all right? You're making deposits in your love bank every moment of every day. You know, you're paying compliments, you're being affectionate, you're talking, you're being intimate, all right? You're building a high balance of love and it's absolutely effortless. You don't have to try. You don't even have to think about it. You make deposits by meeting your partner's emotional needs. But as time goes on and that limerence period fades away after 6, 12, 18 months, right, you need to get smart about how you love your partner. Right? And you need to love them in a way that is most meaningful for them. So, some of you will have read Gary Chapman's book, which I will highly recommend, called The Five Love Languages. And this is just my take on it. Okay, he says there are five love languages. Talk, touch, time, tasks and tokens. And as I go through them, I want you to think to yourself, how do I express love for my partner? What do I want from my partner? What couldn't I live without? Right? And you'll find there's one or two love languages that are very important to you. Now, when I got married to my husband, all right, I'm definitely a talk person. I love conversation, honesty and openness, praise and compliments, encouragement, talking and listening. Okay? And I wanted my husband to tell me that I was the most beautiful, wonderful, perfect woman that he'd ever met that he adored me, he'd never loved anybody as much as he loved me, right? He never said any of it, all right? Now, on the other hand, I am a talk person. So I would say to him, and I still do, I'd say to him, darling, you are the most wonderful husband in the world, I am the luckiest woman in the world, you are absolutely perfect. And you know what he says? I know. <laughs> talk guy. He doesn't need that from me. He doesn't need that stroking. All right? Who likes that stuff? Can you put your hand up if you like that stuff? Yeah, absolutely. I love that and that's what I want. That's what says love to me. The second thing that says love to me is touch. I'm incredibly affectionate. All right? Actually, I'll tell you a little story um, and it, it, it brushes on the subject of touch. When I was in general practice, I used to do the pension and milk run on a Wednesday afternoon. And I would go around and see all the housebound, and usually they were old ladies because old men don't live that long. 
Um, so I used to go and see all the old ladies, take their blood pressure, give them their scripts, make sure they were still alive. Um, and uh, that was what, how I spent my Wednesday afternoon. But my favourite was Ethel, right? And I would just love going to see her. And um, one day, um, and I'm being a very affectionate person, being one of my languages of love, I would often put my arm around her, I would hold her hand. She would always be telling me these great stories and I'd pat her and I'd stroke her and when I was taking her blood pressure, I'd give her a little stroke on the back or whatever. Anyway, one day she said to me, Dr Rosie, she said, your visits mean so much to me. And I said to her, Ethel, I love coming to see you. I said, I just love your story. She said, no, no, you don't understand. She said, before you came, she said, nobody ever touched me. She said, I would wait all day for the paper boy to come because sometimes when he gave me my change, the tips of his fingers would touch my hand. She said, I waited all day for that. Now, when I tell that story, I still get goosebumps, right? Because she was a touch person and she had skin hunger, right? And she was missing that and I was supplying it. I was probably doing her more good by giving her a cuddle than I was by all the medications in the world. So I'm an affectionate person by nature. I, and there's lots of different ways of being affectionate and giving loving touch, um, nurturing, comforting, being playful, right? Sensual touch, sexual touch. Sex is very important to me as well. Now, so what did I want to do with my husband? I wanted to just grab him all the time. I wanted to be kissing and cuddling all the time. And he's kind of going, Ugh. Uh, you know, just back off, baby, all right? Because this is not a language of love for him. Instead, his language of love is quality time. He just wants to be with me, right? We live together. We work together. He's actually an academic, but he also works part-time as my practice manager, right? So we're together 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's the way that he likes it. The thing that he likes most to do is if we have a break between patients, he says come and have a cup of coffee with me, right? Because we pop over the road and have a cup of coffee. Undivided attention, recreational intimacy, just doing stuff together. The activity is incidental, but the focus is critical, that you're focused on the other person. Do something your partner enjoys, all right? Now, for some of you, quality time, spending time with your partner will be an important language of love. His other language of love were acts of service, what I call tasks, right? He will do anything for me. He will pick me up, he will drop me off, he will drive me anywhere, he will take the dry cleaning. He actually does all the cooking, he does all the cleaning, he does all the ironing, all right? I told you he was perfect, didn't I? <laughs> all right? He expresses love by doing things for me, all right? Practical support and thoughtfulness and it may not seem very romantic. I want him to tell me I'm the most beautiful, wonderful, gorgeous woman he ever saw. And he gives me domestic support and financial support and absolute commitment to our family. So it may not seem very romantic, but this is the way he shows love. Now, the final language of love is tokens. All right? Now, I had a, uh, a guy come in uh, last week and um, he said to me, you know... My wife doesn't love me, she doesn't want to have sex with me, she criticises me all the time and she says, you know, that I'm not financially well off enough for her, you know, I don't give her enough presents and I don't buy her a new car and I can't afford to get her all the clothes she wants and she wants manicures and pedicures and hair done and uh, waxing and he said, I can't afford all those things and he said, she's just, she's just a gold digger. And I said to him, no, I said, I don't think so. I said, I think she's a tokens girl, right? Because what people who like tokens, like gifts, flowers, cards, surprises, things that are purchased, found or made, and special occasions are really important to them. Birthdays, anniversaries, Valentine's Day, Christmas Day, Easter, right? For these people, if you forget their birthday, they're absolutely devastated. Now, what did my husband and I do that gave us such a successful marriage? We became multilingual. First of all, I learned that I was not going to get everything I wanted from him, but that he was showing me love in his language, and I learned to appreciate that. 
The other thing that I did was that I started to speak his language of love. I started to show him love by acts of service. I started to show him love by quality time. I started asking him if he'd like to go across the road and have a coffee. So how many of you think that you're, if we go back, okay, a talk person? How many of you think you're a talk person? Pop your hand up. Okay, a lot of you are talk people. Touch people, that includes sex. If sex is important to you, you've got to put your hand up for this one. Yes, absolutely. Quality time. Who wants to spend time with their partner? Just hang out. Look at you all. Wonderful. Okay. Who likes... All right, a lot of women do this, all right? They, they, they say, but I love him, you know? I keep the house beautifully, all right? I don't want to have sex with him, but, uh, you know, all the meals are on the table and the children are dressed and fed and everything is done for him. He doesn't have to lift a finger, all right? Who's acts of service? Yeah. Okay, great. And finally... Any of you tokens? Any of you birthdays, anniversaries, gifts? Yeah? Some of you. See, some of the guys, this is always really interesting to me. Thank you guys who put your hands up because men are much less likely to do that. But the thing that I notice is that there's a spread of these languages of love across the room. Now, I've got a question for you. Is there any couple in the room who have exactly the same languages of love? Can you put your hand up? Okay. Is that a hand up up there? Okay. Now, I only ever had that happen to me once before, all right? And there was a little old couple who was sitting right down the front. It was in Dubbo, all right? And they put their hand up and said they had exactly the same language of love. And I looked at them and they looked exactly the same. <laughs> I couldn't tell which one was the man and which one was the woman. Now, you two, on the other hand, all right, I can see that you are different. Now, out of a whole room of people, they are the only two who have exactly the same languages of love, all right? So it is normal to have different languages of love. So how do you know what your language of love is? What do you ask your partner for? What do you miss most? What makes you feel loved and cared for? What couldn't you live without? Or how do you show love for your partner, all right? Now, think about this, right? And I really suggest that you read the five love languages. Now, we've talked about 23 and a half hour foreplay, right? If you want to have really good 23 and a half hour foreplay, then speak your partner's language of love. Now we're going to talk about foreplay as in touching, okay? You all know what Australian foreplay is. That's you awake, mate. <laughs> Irish foreplay. Brace yourself, Bridget. <laughs> Foreplay once you have kids. Ah, uh, children have a huge effect on people's sex lives. Okay. So this is a question that women often ask me, all right? For Christ's sake, why can't he just hug me without cracking a fat? <laughs> It's not his fault. He's not doing anything wrong. Women, let me tell you something. When a man gets an erection, it's the greatest compliment he can possibly pay you. Right? It means that you turn him on. Right? But what's happening is this. Right? Men turn on much faster than women. Jerry Seinfeld put it beautifully. He said, when it comes to sex, right, for men, it's an emergency and they can be ready in three seconds flat. Right? They're like firemen, okay? And he also said when it comes to women, all right, they're like fire. They need the right conditions to get going. They need time to get going. But once they get going, it's very exciting, <coughs> all right? Now, what we're looking at is the fact that men get turned on really quickly. So if he cuddled you for half an hour, you would probably get turned on too. So there's this difference between male and female sexual response. And if we want to explain why male sexual, dis male sexual arousal looks like this, okay, straight line like this, and this is me getting aroused. It's slower, all right, and Ross is doing all the right things and it's feeling really pleasurable and then suddenly I remember we didn't put the garbage bins out. <laughs> all right, but I'm going to focus. I'm going to focus, all right? I try again, all right, and I'm going, and I'm, this is really good, really good, this is great, and then I look down and my stomach is on the bed beside me. 
right? Women are distractible in their arousal, all right? So, why are men so undistractable? Because they are cavemen. Although it's 2013, we have caveman and cavewoman sexuality, all right? Now, he is designed to be a sperm donor. That's his only role. He desi he's designed so he can perform in a cave with no privacy, with flood, famine, fire, with ferocious beasts, with marauding neighbours. He's designed so that he can get it up, get it in, get it off and get it out before the <laughs> mammoth comes over the hill and crushes everybody. Right? No? And so when he gets ar aroused really quickly and he's ready to go hours before you are, all right, um, it's not because he's selfish or inconsiderate, it's because of his biology, all right? But our biology, all right, also has an effect on us. So we have this slowed arousal and we're very distractible and sometimes we find it really, really difficult to get turned on, really hard to stay focused, right? And that's because we're baby minders. If we go back to caveman times, okay, let's say that you've got Mr and Mrs Cave person and they're making love in the cave. And over there in the corner is Junior on a bearskin rug having a little nap. And a sabre-toothed tiger comes creeping into the cave and decides to have Junior for breakfast. Who's going to notice first, Mum or Dad? <laughs> Mum, absolutely. Dad's on top, chuffing away like a steam train, <laughs> like this, all right? But you girls, you've always got one ear open, right? Especially there's a baby in the room because I've heard it. You have an incredible, what I call the invisible umbilical cord, right? You're attached to that baby. We're attached to our children. It doesn't matter really how old they are. Um, mine even live in America, both of them, and I'm still attached to them by an umbilical cord. Um, once women have children, they're far more distractible, right? So that's one of the things that happens um, as your relationship matures and you get children. So it's not that men are selfish or inconsiderate, it's just that they're rapidly arousable and undistractable. It's not that women are slow or frigid, right? It's just that they're very distractible and it takes time, which is why women need foreplay. Now, on a good day, you may not need much foreplay. You may, may need three minutes or five minutes, all right, because you're hot to trot and ready to go, right? But on an average day, you might need 15 or even 20 minutes before you even get anywhere near being excited. And if you're tense or tired, this may take longer. And as you get older, your arousal slows. Now, that doesn't mean that older people don't have sex. Mrs Smith goes to a doctor. And he says, she's 90 years old. Mrs Smith goes to the doctor and the doctor says, Mrs Smith, I've never seen you looking so well. He said, what's your secret? And she said, well, doctor, she said, I have a new boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And he's 19 years old. <laughs> And the doctor said, oh, my God, you're 90 and he's 19? That's life-threatening. And Mrs Smith said, if he dies, he dies. <laughs> OK. So, men and women are different. All right? I hope you're getting the picture. And we're different in the ways that we turn on. All right? Now, a man's genitals are pleasurable 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Right? If you fondle a man's genitals, he's going to be appreciative. Right? Right? If I could have a volunteer from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> now, once my volunteer got over the shock of being molested by a middle-aged grandmother, um, he would like that, all right? because men love genital stimulation. They want more of it. A lot of guys say to me, I don't get enough genital stimulation. You know, she won't touch me. She doesn't give me oral sex. You know, I really want more genital stimulation. But once a man's genitals become aroused, then the rest of his body turns on, right? So you can always touch a man's genitals and he will like it. Of unless, of course, you know, he's... Uh, uh, unless you're... A, yeah, no, I won't even go there. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, so you can see here, men turn on from the genitals outwards, OK? What about women? We turn on from the fingertips and the hair and the toes inward. And our erogenous zones, our breasts, our genitals and our buttocks do not become pleasurable until we are highly aroused. Now, what does that mean in real life? Okay, let's say that I'm standing at the kitchen sink. Now, this is one of the reasons why men are so confused, by the way. I'm standing at the kitchen sink, I'm doing the washing up. 
And my husband, who knows better than to do this, but let's say he did it. My husband comes up behind me and decides to get a bit amorous and starts to fondle my breasts. Okay? This is a question for the women in the audience. Is it going to turn me on or off? Absolutely. It's unanimous. All right? Knee jerk reaction. Absolutely. You mean one of these? <laughs> No, but it's kind of pushing him away like this because it's irritating, it's unpleasant, all right? Sometimes it can even be painful, but it's not pleasurable because women's breasts, genitals and buttocks do not become pleasurable, they do not become erotic until women are quite highly aroused, all right? So the problem is, all right, well, let's just get this here. Women turn on from the fingertips and the hair and the toes inwards, okay? Now, the problem is men know, know, men know what turns them on. You go straight for the hot spot. That's where it all starts. That's the go button right there, OK? So what does he do when he tries to turn you on? He uses the und hier foreplay technique. I'll have to show it to you. It's here und hier und hier. <laughs> Right? Because that's what works for him. And you're going, oh, that feels terrible. Oh, my clitoris. Oh, that's painful. Stop doing that. Just go away. All right? What he needs to do right, is to caress you, kiss you, hold you, stroke you. All of the lips, the cheeks, the neck, the top of the back, the shoulders, the, to the tops and the arms, all erogenous zones, the thighs, the lower part of the back. Right? Avoid the hot spots to begin with. All right? Warm her up first. Remember, she's like fire. So she in <laughs> well, I can't help you there. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to talk about snore play. All right, we've talked about foreplay. Now we're going to talk about snore play because this is another question that women ask me. They say, why does he go into a coma after sex? All right? Now, once again, it's not because he's a selfish, inconsiderate bastard. All right? He's a victim of his physiology. All right? Because when men have an orgasm, they get this burst of endorphins really quickly, in 20 to 30 seconds, so that one minute, you know, he's doing it, and the next minute he's rolled over, snoring like a horse and drooling, all right? And you think to yourself, you're sort of like left there counting the roses on the wallpaper, and you wonder what happened, right? The thing is that women get endorphin release, but it takes much longer for us to get endorphin release. So it might take three to five minutes if we have an orgasm, up to 20 minutes. But there is good news, and that is, if a man can engage in a little semi-conscious afterplay. Now, what's afterplay? Um, kissing, cuddling, sweet words, all right? Just a bit of stroking. If you can just do that, you will actually trigger endorphin release and then you can, in the woman, and you can go off to sleep together. Doesn't that sound nice? So afterplay is really important to women. Men, uh, they can give it a miss, all right? But foreplay and afterplay are really important to women. Um, and I always say that afterplay is the hallmark of a man who is a really good lover, all right? Guys think that jumping on and doing this makes them a good lover. It's the stuff that you do outside the bedroom, it's the stuff you do during foreplay, and it's the stuff you do after having intercourse that makes it good. Okay, now I said I'd talk about oxytocin again. Now, after play is really important because during sexual activity, during penetration, during orgasm, oxytocin is released from the brain. And oxytocin is known as the cuddle chemical. But some of you might have heard of oxytocin if you've ever breastfed a baby, right? Because oxytocin gives the letdown reflex, all right? You remember you put the baby on the breast and whoosh, you get a, a surge of milk. That's the letdown reflex. Now, that is due to oxytocin. So the idea is this, all right? This is Mother Nature again. I'm breastfeeding my baby. I'm filled with oxytocin. It's the cuddle chemical. It gives me feelings of bonding towards my baby. 
feelings of connection, feelings of trust, all right? So that this is one of the reasons. There's always a reason for our physiology. Now, oxytocin has the same effect in human beings. It, it creates feelings of bonding, of connection and trust between couples. You can actually improve your relationship by using oxytocin. Now I'm going to talk to you about a little experiment, okay? Just to prove to you that afterplay is important. Now when we do sexual research, we tend to use rats um, because they're kind of like us in some ways. And um, in this experiment, they had four male rats and one female rat. And what they did is they put Miss Rat in with Mr Rat A. They let them copulate. They took her out immediately. They put her in with Mr Rat B. They let them copulate. They took her out immediately. They put her in with Rat Mr C. They let them copulate. They took her out immediately. <coughs> Finally, they put her in with Rat Mr D. They copulated, but she stayed for afterplay, right? They brushed whiskers. They sniffed each other's bottoms. I don't know what rats do in afterplay, but whatever it is, they did it, okay? Then they put all five rats together and she got to choose which rat she liked best. Who did she like best? Absolutely, because she had oxytocin. She had bonded with him. It is the cuddle chemical and it is so important. And it's brought us right back to where we started at the beginning with the importance of touch, right? Because if you touch your partner, you not only get those wonderful endorphins, but you also get oxytocin, which gives you a feeling of intimacy, bondedness and connectedness. And this can often overcome some of the distance that we feel um, with our partners. Now, people often say to me, because they want a quick fix, all right, is there just one thing that I could do every day to improve my relationship, right? And the answer is yes, and it relies on oxytocin. A big bear hug, all right? As couples kind of mature, they, they give what I call the A-frame kiss. They kiss like this, all right? Got to make sure that none of the body parts touch because then he's going to want sex and he'll never go out the door, etc., etc. <laughs> all right? So we have the A-frame kiss. So you stop the kissing, you stop the cuddling, you stop the touching, all right? Why does it have to be a seven-second hug, all right? That's one one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand, four one thousand, five one thousand, six one thousand, seven one thousand. That's what it takes to get oxytocin flush, all right? It takes that long to get your oxytocin. So there's no point in hugging for two seconds. Now, what will happen when you hug it like this is that one of you will want to draw away first. And you all know who it is. You know the person who kind of starts to withdraw from the hug. I know it's, it's not me, I can assure you. I want to just keep on hugging and hugging and hugging. My, my husband's kind of pushing me away. Right? But the idea is to hug until you are both completely relaxed. Because if you can just go, get through that wanting to withdraw, wanting to distance, and let your bodies both relax, that is when you will get oxytocin. And that will automatically improve your relationship. Let's use our physiology wisely. Why not use our biology to improve our relationships? Now, our relationships are like a rare tropical plant, right? You've got to nurture it or it'll die, and you need to make it your highest priority in life. I certainly do in my life. Now, I'm just at the end, all right? Um, <laughs> it's cute, isn't it? <laughs> but I want to just tell you one more story. All right, and it's about... It's, it's, it's about, it's about relationships, because I've got a minute, and it's about relationships. And it's about the fact that it is very difficult for men to apologise, all right? Women apologise for breathing. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. The only time that a man will really apologise is to avoid a fight with another guy. Sorry, mate, didn't mean it, sorry, mate. Right? But it's very hard for men to apologise. But guys, if you screw up, 
All she wants is an apology. Would you girls agree with that? Would it be nice if you said sorry? Yes, absolutely. But it's actually really difficult for men to say sorry because little boys are raised to compete. If we go back to kindergarten, we've got a group of girls and a group of boys. Right? The group of girls right, are given the task of building a Lego castle. And they do a beautiful job. The little boys are given the same task, build a Lego castle, do a beautiful job. But in the meantime, the girls have got to know each other. It's a social occasion. They know each other's names. They know the names of their dollies. They know their favourite colour, right? The boys are completely focused on the task and totally disinterested in each other. Then we go to primary school. Let's look at boys' games. They're played in big groups. There's winners, there's losers, there's rules. And the idea is to be a winner. The idea is to compete. Right? Little girls, we play in twos and threes. We share, we take turns, we want to fit in, we want to be liked. We're trained to cooperate. Right? What does this mean when men get into relationships? It means that status is very important to men. And to apologise is to lose status. Right? It's just to bring yourself one step down. And that's hard for men. So guys, I would say to you, if I was going to give you a tip about how to get along better with your spouse, and that is that when you screw up, if you just say, I'm sorry, often that is all that is needed. Now, speaking about competition, right, it's a starry night out on the prairie. Three cowboys are sitting around the campfire and they're talking about which cowboy is the toughest. And the first cowboy says, <laughs> I'm the toughest cowboy here. Said the other day a steer got loose from the corral. He said, I grabbed it with my bare hands, wrestled it to the earth and tied it up. All the while I was whistling Dixie. That's how tough I am. The second cowboy said, ha, that's nothing. Just the other day I was walking through the brush. Out came a rattlesnake, picked it up with my bare hands, ripped off its head and drank down its venom like it was a shot of bourbon. That's how tough I am. Now, the third cowboy said nothing. He just sat there silently stirring the coals of the campfire with his penis. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.